So I'd like to welcome James Finlayson up on stage. So James, you are the head of innovation, which is by the way a really cool title at Verve Search. And uh, as you guys might have noticed, we're going to talk about getting the links that matter. Yep. Um, as we all know, it's quantity and not quality, right? <laughs> yes, good. Um, and I wanted to ask you, James, because we were t I was telling you about this organization called Friends yesterday, and one of the things they do is they um, help young people get a mentor. Uh, do you have a mentor, or are you a mentor to someone? Um, well, I suppose about halfway through my career, I kind of adopted someone else's mentor. The colleague next to mine got my current boss as a mentor um, in some competition that was run. Um, and I actually back-channeled all my questions I had about SEO through him to her. So uh, she's been helpful for, uh, to me for a number of years as a result. Cool. Would you recommend everyone to get a mentor? Yeah, I mean, and, and it doesn't necessarily need to be someone obvious, actually. We've just changed the way we do mentorship at Verve. Cool. It used to basically be your manager would make sure that your career path was continuing, and now it's we pair people up based on what they're trying to learn. So you might have people in outreach who want to get really technical, mm. or you have other people who want to be good at speaking, for example, um, and personality, because it's more about where you need to be and who can help you achieve that than a rigid structure in an organization. Cool. So guys, get a mentor or mentor someone. Good message. Go. OK, James, have fun. The stage is all yours. Thank you. Hello, I'm James Finlayson. I'm the head of innovation at Verve Search, and I'm going to start with an apology and a confession. Um, so first, the apology. There's not a single Star Wars reference in any of my slides. I'm really sorry. I missed a memo. Uh, uh, and the confession. So I'm supposed to be speaking today about how to get links from these places. I basically can't pronounce most of these places. Whenever I do, this is what happens at Verve. Yeah. Um, so instead, I'm going to tell you about my mother-in-law. Now, bear with me with this, OK? My mother-in-law is a hairdresser. And she was speaking to a client one day and, and was told, you need to be on Twitter. All business is on Twitter. You need a Twitter presence. So she started a Twitter account. You should all follow her. I think it would be amazing if we could quadruple her followers in a single day. Won't freak her out at all. Um, now, apart from the fact that she's got an amazing follower, uh, following to follower ratio already, here are a few reasons you should follow her. Here's one tweet, half head of highlights. Another tweet, full head of highlights. <laughs> and because she's been told it's important to interact on Twitter, she occasionally tweets at my wife. <laughs> there are 328 million micro-publishers on Twitter. If Twitter was a country, it would be the size of the US. My mother-in-law is also thinking of starting a WordPress blog. And if she does and she sends out her first blog post, that blog post will be one of 37 million blog posts on WordPress.com that went live that month alone. To put it in other words, if we printed out all those blog posts, every month and a half we could fill the shelves of Malmo Library just with blog posts from WordPress.com. There are 7.6 billion people in the world. There are 400 billion stars in the sky. And as best we can count, there are 900 billion websites. That's over 100 websites for every man, woman, and child alive. But think about the websites you've been on this month. Think about the websites you were on last month. The average person actually only visits 89 websites a month. If you were to do that every single month of your life, by the end of your life, you would have visited 0.00001% of the internet. We think we know the internet. Most of us have never seen almost any of it. That percentage is like telling everyone, I'm going out to see the world. And then you never leave Malmo. In fact, it's like 2 thirds of Malmo relative to the rest of the world. But we think we know it. And that's a problem, right? Because if you are a micro-publisher like my mother-in-law, you can chuck out as many tweets as you want, but most of it will never be read. Most websites, and if you're a brand and you're trying to push content out to those websites, 
most of it will never be read or will be read by such a tiny audience that it just doesn't matter. So what do we do? Well, let's go back to those 89 websites a month. It's not random, those websites you go to. It's not a different set of 89 websites every single month. In fact, if you think about the websites you've been to this month and the websites you've been to last month, they're mostly going to be the same sites, right? And despite us thinking that the world is becoming into, it's turning into more and more tribes and we're tearing apart, most people go to the same 89 websites a month. In fact, in Sweden, half of all internet traffic goes to just 75 websites. And the rest is split between 899 billion websites. This is important because if you're trying to get content out there and you put it on one of these other sites, and we know that people only read 89 websites a month and there are 18, 899 billion sites in this side of it, how is it ever going to get in front of people that will actually convert? How is it actually going to get in front of anyone that's meaningful? That's a problem for brands. What are those 75 websites? Well, they're these. I won't ask you who's been on all of them this month, um, because there are some that split between brands and publishers, and amongst the companies in that list, there are some that you probably wouldn't want to get coverage on. I'm guessing if I turned around to my mother-in-law and said, guess what, I've got you a link on Pornhub, <laughs> I'm not getting seconds at pudding anymore. It's probably a good thing, actually. Um, so let's just talk about the publishers in that list. Oh, by the way, quick trick, Frederick's in the room. If you want a link from Ikea, buy him beer. I'm doing that tonight. So let's just talk about the publishers. These become the most important links in Sweden because these are the only publishers that you're guaranteed if you get on these that your content will get in, in front of a significant part of the Swedish population, will actually get viewed. Because if no one sees what you're pushing out there, why the heck does it matter? Now, you might think, so far, what I've said is basically do PR. It's not. Because Google worked this out themselves a long time ago. I said this split between companies and publishers. But Mac Hutz said, we actually came up with a classifier to say, OK, IRS or Wikipedia or New York Times over here and everything else over here. If you look at those 75 websites, they're all over there. If you think about the sites that most people are getting coverage on, getting links from, the small bloggers, the small sites that are reference sites, they're over here. Google understands the difference between these 75 massively important sites and their ilk, and the sites that actually most of us have been targeting over the last few years. And Google also said brands are the solution. Brands are how you sort out the cesspool. Google wants to uh, rank brands because brands don't give you a virus when you visit their site. Brands typically don't have fake news unless you're the Daily Mail. Brands can be trusted, and frankly, people click on brands more often. So it's really important for Google to understand a brand from a non-brand. How does it do that? Well, there's lots of ways to understand whether something's a brand or not. But let's take five of the biggest brands in the world to understand one curious thing that they have in, com uh, in connection. Each, each of these five brands have links from The Atlantic, CBS News, CNET, Wikipedia, Ars Technica, and BBC. In fact, if you went back to that list of 75 sites, the vast majority of them are linking to at least three of these five brands. So brands consistently have links from other massive brands and the biggest publishers out there. If you think about a small site, a small company, chances are they won't have links from any of these. But big brands always do. It's a massive, uh, massive fingerprint as to this is a brand versus this isn't. Tolstoy said, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. I'm here to say successful sites are all alike. Every unsuccessful site is unsuccessful in its own way. All these big sites that are receiving tons of traffic from Google consistently have links from big authority, trusted sites. Again, how do you do that? What connects these? Well, the vast majority of these sites are trusted, accurate, or reliable. 
And Google has a pattern obtaining authoritative search results dedicated to working out whether a site is just that. The vast majority of those sites have a high readership. And Google has a pattern website quality signal generation to work out just that. These have been built up over years. Google's getting better and better and better at understanding big authoritative sites from sites that aren't. Because those authoritative sites are hard to gain. The small ones, sometimes they accept money for links. Sometimes they're set up by marketing firms purely to put the links there. You can't do that with the big ones. And by the way, if you're going after a site that isn't trusted, accurate, or reliable, or doesn't have a high readership, well, since Penguin 2.0, that link might count for nothing at all. Google now devalues a link if it doesn't think it's worthy, if it doesn't think it has enough value. So if you've been building a ton of links recently and it's been doing nothing for you, you started thinking maybe links aren't powerful, maybe they don't do anything anymore, chances are you're actually building the sort of links that Penguin 2.0 was built to devalue. It's not that links don't count anymore, it's that you have to have the right links, the links that count. Now, I'm a realist. I know that some of you are sat there going, that's cool, but I've got a KPI of getting 10 links a month, or I've got a KPI of getting 20 links a month. And actually, my boss doesn't give a crap whether it's a big site or not. He just wants lots and lots of links. And what you're suggesting sounds like I'm going to end up with one, or best case scenario, maybe 75. I don't know. Well, let me give you a real-life example of why actually it doesn't work out that way. This is a piece of coverage that we got for Go Compare. Um, it's about investing in comic books, which it turns out can make you a, a, ton, a ton of money. They've gone up faster than gold, and you could have an old comic book in your attic which could be worth a million dollars. Piece of coverage in The Guardian. Big, big publisher. Nice, juicy link in there, too. This is one piece of coverage, one followed link. But when this went live, we got 32 other sites covering it too. 32 other sites linking back to the client at the same time. Because everyone reads this site, including all the other bloggers, including people at brands who have to write blog posts. So you get all that other coverage for free if you get the big sites. If you get the big sites, you still get quantity. You're not sacrificing quantity but you don't have to reach out to all that quantity. You get the one link, you get the two, three, four big links, and the rest all come in automatically because they're read and they're picked up on these. Plus, of course, there's the brand value. You can start speaking to people's brand teams about, look, we've got the brand in front of all these people. The PR value, when you can say a campaign got a million views. But even if we put ourselves in a vacuum, and we say all we care about is SEO, SEO value, and links. Google's repeatedly been altering their algorithm to value more and more sites that are trusted, authoritative, highly read, and that routinely receive links back from other brands and other big publishers. So those are the type of links you need to be building, because they're the links that can move the, le the needle. They're the links that matter. So I've told you what kind of links you need to get. Now let's talk about how. And that starts with a story about Willard. Willard is a friend I've known for years, but he's also a freelance journalist. He's written for The Telegraph, he's written for The Times, he's written for most big newspapers in Britain. And I met up with him the other day and I said, Willard, how many emails do you receive a day? And he looked at me and he said, a shitload. But when I asked him to actually check, he found that he received 800 emails a day. You can't read 800 emails a day. And if you're working at a big publisher, you'll be required to push out 15 stories a day. Gone are the days of working for two months on an investigative journalism piece. Most journalists are required nowadays, they're relatively junior, to sit there and chuck out content because they need views on the website, they need engagement on the website, because that pays the bills because they get more ad, uh, ad views. So if you're required to chuck out 15 pieces of content a day, meanwhile your inbox is spilling over with 800 emails a day, how the heck do you make that choice about what you publish? And as a brand, 
how do you get that golden ticket of being in the 2% that a journalist is going to write about? For us, it comes back to very old school things. So we talk about thinking like a 50s ad exec and executing like a geek. That was a fun day at work, dress up. Um, it comes back to actually something that Dan Heath talks about in Made to Stick, which is making sure that the content you're creating is has the success framework, that it's simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional stories. And because we're online, we add a, a second S. Also, it makes it spell it correctly. Big problem I had with Dan Heath's work the whole way through. Uh, we add in shareable because that gets your variety, that gets things moving. Let's talk about each in turn. Simple. Uh, do we have any lawyers or former lawyers in the room? No, it's just going to be me that gets a kick out of this then. OK, simple. Let me read this out. I give, you all and, uh, I give you all and singular my estate and interest, right, title, claim, and advantage of, and in that orange, with all its rind, skin, juice, pulp, and pips, and all right and advantage therein, with full power to bite, cut, suck, and otherwise eat the same, or give the same away as fully and effectively as I said, a, uh, as I the said, a B, and now entitled to bite, cut, suck, or otherwise eat the same orange, or give the same away, with or without its rind, skin, juice, pulp, and pips, Anything herein before or herein after or in any other deed or deeds, instruments or instruments of, wit, uh, of what nature or kind whatsoever, to the contrary, in any wise notwithstanding. I can do that because I used to be a lawyer. Does anyone know what the hell that's saying? Yeah, you can have my orange. And by the way, you can do what the heck you want with it. I'm giving you this orange. That's all it says. If a journalist receives this, he will never, ever understand what you're talking about. It's amazing the amount of press releases that I've read that are so complicated, that use so much marketing wank that you, the message is lost, right? All this is saying is, I'm giving you an orange. Now, I'm not saying when you're contacting journalists, you have to write everything in four-word sentences. Some of the best outreach we've ever done, some of the best links we've ever got, have been in emails that were over a thousand words long. Simple is not as small as possible. Simple is easy to digest, is potentially bulleted, is easy to skim over and understand what the heck this is and if there's value. Let me show you that in terms of a campaign. So this is a campaign we built for Go Compare, who are a comparison site in the UK. It's for life insurance as a product. And what we looked at was fictional deaths. We looked at deaths in movies. And we got a bunch of data about deaths in movies, and we split it up in all sorts of ways. So for example, you can see which rom-com has the most deaths, which uh, decade has the most deaths, and if deaths in movies are increasing in, uh, over different decades. All kind of sub-angles and secondary points that journalists didn't give a shit about, honestly. What they cared about was that Guardians of the Galaxy is the deadliest film of all time. That's simple. Guardians of the Galaxy has 83,000 deaths, on-screen deaths in the film, in an hour and a half. Wow. And when it got covered, it turned into Guardians of the Galaxy, list of deadliest films with 83,000 fatalities. Simple. That's your headline. And actually what you'll find as things move through publishers is they get simpler and simpler. So this is the director of Guardians of the Galaxy, James Gunn, tweeting it. And by the time he was tweeting it, it turns into, Guardians of the Galaxy is now the deadliest film in movie history. Bam. Nice and simple, nice and concrete. You have to be thinking about what the headline is and how simply that can be corresponded to the most basic denominator. Uh, no, denominator because the journalists will not have time to craft that story. They effectively need to be given it on a platter this is what you need to say to be impactful. And that is done when it's concrete. And when you do that, I mean, this campaign got 620 pieces of coverage on CBS, Digital Spy, The Guardian, AOL, A NME, ABC. And that was mostly in a week that that went around because it was so simple. But not just because it was so simple, right? It was also the second letter. It was unexpected. Now, let me let you into a little secret with this campaign. So for the longest time when we were running the data, Dracula Untold, has anyone seen Dracula Untold? 
Dracula Untold was the most deadly film of all time for about 75% of us working on this data. If anyone's seen the film, it's basically two hours of fighting and a massive battle. So we almost had a story which was, a film which just features nothing but death is the deadliest film of all time. Yeah, okay. That's not unexpected, that's not a story. But PG-13 Disney film, 83,000 deaths, that's unexpected, suddenly that's a story. And that's a big part of why this went viral. Then you've got to be concrete. And concrete's about people's inability to understand maths, basically. So when you tell someone something's 100 calories, they don't get it. Or if they get it, what they do is they turn it into something in their mind. What they say is 100 calories, that's a slice of bread. People understand the physicality of something, they never understand the numbers, or they never understand the numbers enough to have an emotional resonance from it. So when I said to you that there were 37 million blog posts going live on WordPress.com, I also told you to contextualize it, to make it concrete, that you could fill Malmo Library with them. If you don't make it concrete, then you're cutting off a big swathe of your audience. You just do not have time to try to put that into something that makes sense for them. Or they will, and they'll totally muck it up, which can sometimes be interesting, but mostly will end up meaning no coverage. Let's talk about credibility. So I said that a journalist was receiving 800 emails a day, they've got to get 15 articles out. The brutal facts are that journalists play fast and loose with this. They will not check, and I've seen this from so many pieces of coverage that have gone live, they will not check the facts that you're giving them unless they're already really suspect about them. But they equally will not go live with something unless they have a feeling that it is credible. And when you've got brands coming out and saying, for example, this is the deadliest film of all time, what the heck does the brand know about that? Uh, we did another campaign for uh, Go Compare called Coining It In, where we found coins with misprints. So we said, if you find this coin in your handbag, then actually it could be worth a thousand pounds. This other coin could be worth 10,000 pounds. These coins that you just have lying around that actually have one little thing wrong with it that, that make them super valuable. But what does Go Compare a comparison site know about rare coins? Nothing. We had no credibility on the subject. So what did we do? Well, we turned around to an organization called Chards. They are coin experts. Like, if you want to buy rare coins, you go to Chards in the UK. And we turned around to them and said, look, we're doing this campaign. Go compare basically paying for it, but we'll make sure that you're referenced if you help us with the data, if we're allowed to say that you helped us put together the facts in this. And they said, yeah, this sounds like a great deal for us. We get a bunch of free PR, we get some links out of it too, and all we have to do is spend an hour checking through a list that you've already put together, give some feedback. So they did that, and then when we went to journalists, we said, go compare and put this together in association with coin experts' charts. The extra few words gives it that credibility that means that even if the data was massively wrong, and actually one journalist misunderstood something and we had to go back and tell her to fix it in an article, they're never going to check because that credibility is there. That campaign went on to get 65 pieces of coverage. These big sites all believed in the credibility of the campaign because we were collaborating. Um, got viewed over 400,000 times and has been shared 20,000 times. Shareable. So I've skipped over emotional um, because people get that, right? But people get confused with shareable because you can make the best campaign in the world, but if people don't share it, then it's so much harder to get that traction with it. And people share things basically for one reason, and that's to make themselves look good. They want to make themselves look charitable. They want to make themselves look intelligent. They want to make themselves look funny. But if you go, and go home and check your Facebook feed or check Twitter, it's depressing how much you can basically say it's been shared because it makes that person in some way look good. Good. I'm going to give you two, uh, two example campaigns that we did for Expedia. So World of Music is a quiz that's all about how bands aren't really from where they sound like they're from. 
So for example, um, where are Houston from? Sweden. Where are I'm from Barcelona from? Also Sweden. Seems Swedes are particularly bad at naming themselves after random places. So it turns out tons of bands are from all over the place and you never even realize it. And this is what that quiz does. It asks you to guess where a band's from and find out actually they're really from halfway across the world. The second quiz is an accent map. So we, show you, so we play an accent in, from the UK and you have to guess on the map where that accent's from. This is really hard. Like seriously, unless our, our resident music uh, guy in the office sucked at this because they're all obscure bands because they've got to have a, name, a location in the name and they're never, ever, ever from where they claim to be. This, as long as you spent like more than two days in the UK, you should be pretty good at. Like accents are relatively broad geographical areas and therefore it's pretty easy to get top marks at this. They both did around about equally well in terms of links, but when we're talking about shareability, this one killed that one. No one wanted to share that they got one out of 10. Everyone wanted to share that they got 10 out of 10. I am a linguistic hero. Not that they cared about linguistic uh, uh, stuff, not that they cared about accents 10 minutes beforehand, but they got 10 out of 10, right? They look brilliant. They're sharing that one. I'm not saying create quizzes because people share quizzes. I'm saying people share things to make themselves look good. So when you create a campaign, think, what does sharing this do to that person? Does it embarrass them because it's about a particular subject? Does it make them potentially look awful in some sort of light? How can you twe tweak it so that they're like, ah, yeah, cool. That's, that's something really shareable. Let's put it all together in a campaign that we did uh, last year about Malmö. So we work with Expedia in Sweden and um, we wanted to do something about Malmö and we were told about Malmö Hus Slot, Malmö Castle. And we're told about its history and it's got all these things going on with it and how it used to be a, a prison and now, uh, now you can go around it. And effectively what I kept on hearing was you just have to experience it you just have to go there, otherwise I can't explain to you why it's so cool. And I said, that's really unhelpful. We're trying to do something online. I can't tell people, like, free tickets to Malmo and then you'll understand. No. So what we did was we sent a photographer there and we did an internal street view of the castle. But it's not just internal street view. As you enter rooms, a voice starts talking, telling you what you're seeing, as if you've got an audio guide with you. And you can click on paintings, and you can see the large version of them, and you can read about them as if you were just peering into that little note that's next to them. We made it so it was like you were really there. We gave you that experience, that virtual experience of exploring the castle. And of course we worked with the castle to do it because I think they think we're crazy if we turn up with a camera crew and said, hey, we want two visitor passes. A result? Esvete sent their film crew and wanted to interview us, not just write about it online, they wanted to do a piece to go on the, new, the local news about it. They showed the app. We sent out our outreach person out to Malmo to be interviewed. We also gave them access to the museum curator. The museum was so pumped they put on a um, special night for it and pulled in a load of contacts from themselves, which is great because we've got them now outreaching for us effectively too. But they're excited because it's basically us saying, you should go here, right? We're doing free marketing for them again. But of course, we always say you should go there sponsored by Expedia. What this campaign was, well, it wasn't unexpected, right? Someone was gonna do it at some point. It wasn't particularly emotional. Like, some people might really love Malmo Castle, but for everyone else, it was interesting. And it wasn't actually particularly shareable. It's like, cool, this thing's been done. But I don't look particularly good for sharing it. I just don't look bad. But what it was, was simple. Virtual tour of Malmo Castle. It was concrete. We're not asking you to extrapolate anything, understand anything com uh, complicated. Click and make your way around the castle. 
It was really credible because it was the actual castle and we gave people access to uh, the curators for extra information. And there are a bunch of stories already at Malma Castle that you could explore by going through the piece and that journalists could write up as part of their article about it. With the success matrix, you don't have to have all of them. This isn't a strict, your campaign will fly if you get all of them and die if you get none. But it's meant to be a framework for you so you can critically analyze campaigns and understand what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and based on that, how well or not they're likely to do. We put this at the ideation phase. So when we've got the ideas originally, we run them all through here and go, you know what? This one's kicking ass on this and this and this. What can we add in to make it more shareable? What can we add in to make it more emotional? That campaign got 86 links. Uh, from places like Visit Sweden, which for Expedia is huge, right, getting the National Tourist Board to link to you. Um, SVT, Spressen, um, all across the Nordics. Also did quite well in, um, in, uh, in England and America, actually, um, because we, we sold it in as like Tourism 2.0, the future of tourism. Now you can go abroad without actually ever going abroad. So we got some uh, coverage all around the world for the piece, too. But it would be really nice for me to sit here and go, or stand, and say, that's all you need to do. To get those big links, you need to know who you're going after, and you need to build something brilliant, use this framework to do it. But honestly, there's a much harder part to it too, which is that you've got to have passion and perseverance. If you've ever read Angela Duckworth's book, Grit, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't, read the book. It's one of the best reads I've had in years, because it so succinctly lays out exactly how this is transformative to what you do. If you don't have passions and perseverance, half of the stuff we do would end up not being built. Let me give you an example. We did a campaign in Norway called Virtual Flom. It's a 360 train journey on Flom Railway, which is one of the most beautiful and steepest train journeys in the world. So we came up with the idea, we pitched it to the client, and they said, we love this, please make that for us. And we said, cool, there'll be some extra budget needed because we kind of need to do a bunch of things to do it. And they said, no, do it for free. And we said, how the hell are we going to do that? And it would have been so easy to kill the idea at that stage. But we said, aha, OK, we've worked on a bunch of things before. We kind of know what we're doing here. So we found a videographer, and we went to them, and we said, look, we can't pay you for this, but I know that you struggle because most big companies don't let you put stuff in your portfolio. You can put this in your portfolio. Not only that, but people will be asking us how we made it, and we'll make sure there's a shout out to you when we talk about that. Will you do it for free? And they said, yes, of course, just cover our costs, which of course we found a guy in the UK, so it was flights and hotel and, and food whilst he's out there. So we went to Flom Tourist Board, and we said, look, we basically want to go worldwide with how amazing Flom is and how amazing this journey is. We've got a videographer, we've got a history of doing things like this we can show you. We just need his flights and his, uh, and his hotel paid for. And they said yes. And then we went to the train company and we said, look, we kind of need access to the train, to the front of the train, and we need a guard there, and we need the train stopped for like half a day so we can fit this. That's totally cool, right? And they said, yes. Now, I'm kind of making it sound easy, all the steps that led to this. But actually, it was a year in the making. This got pushed from a 2006, 2015 campaign to launch in December 2016 in the end. Every step of the way, it got harder and harder and harder, and we could have dropped out. I mean, we were dealing with weather at some stage and going, it's going to snow soon. We need to send them out there. Without passions, passions and perseverance, this never would have happened. We would have dropped this campaign so easily. We didn't, and it went on to get 203 pieces of coverage, all the majors in Norway, the Norwegian Tourist Board, local council, Flom Tourist Board themselves, Lonely Planet, Mail Online, The Telegraph, big, big publications all across the world. It got viewed 300,000 times. But that never would have happened if we didn't persevere, if we didn't have passion, if we didn't put grit behind it. This one's way harder than the first thing I talked about, talk, finding the sites, reaching out to the sites with stuff that works. Because it's about people. It's about finding and retaining the right people. Back in 2014, we were getting links 
like most other agencies back then, from good but not great sites. And every year we were seeing that the amount of effort we were putting in to get the same effect for our clients was going down. This is effectively time put in by us versus results for clients, and the hard results as in cash in bank, traffic increases, those sort of things. And we're like, look, if we continue to do this, eventually all our clients are going to sack us. So we changed two things in 2014. One, we decided to only go after the links that mattered. Only those big sites that we knew would transfer huge authority and would lead to all the secondary coverage in any case. Those are the only sites we speak to now. We don't split it up. We don't spend some time speaking to bloggers. We only speak to the sites that matter. We went in hard on that single philosophy. And two, and actually much harder, we said goodbye to a bunch of colleagues and just started interviewing for passion and perseverance. Most people that join Verve haven't done a day of SEO in their life but they have a ton of grit. We've had people who have put on festivals. We've had people who've done stuff for Green, uh, Greenpeace and not told them about it until the day. Everyone has passion and perseverance. They, everyone has grit. Because when we do that, we've seen results increase every single year since. Every single year since we made those changes, we've won, we've been lucky enough to win best agency in Europe because we've been able to get results for our clients that were so radically different. Expedia, across the whole of the Nordics, saw a 30% increase in visibility in 2015. They saw a 46% increase in 2016. This isn't going from 30 to 46. This is another 46% increase. So far this year, we're tracking at 54% increase because we're kind of getting more and more single-minded about just this method, just going after those big links with stuff that fits those metrics. I'm not telling you this to brag. I'm not telling you this to show off. I'm telling you it because it works, because it's been transformative, not just for our clients, but for us, Verve. We got the right people with the right philosophy who are passionate and have grit. We had the right strategy of just going after these big links and a singular focus on getting the links that matter. Because when you do that, you achieve astounding results. By building the links that truly matter and persevering, even when, especially when things are hard, at their hardest, that's how you win. That's how you and your company grows. Thank you.